Okay, again, good morning. And uh, as I was talking earlier, I'm uh, going to send you a survey, guys. And uh, the survey is basically, see if anybody has something before this class, I want to change the time to about uh, 10 minutes before, because uh, first of all, I think we're a little bit behind. I mean, not that, uh, that it should not, it should be a problem that we go slow, but that's fine. I think we need to catch up a little. But the other thing also, and that's actually the main reason, honestly, is because I have a class immediately after yours. So I would want to have an, about five, 10 minutes, maybe a span of time so that I can go get something to, basically to drink and things like that and come back. So I want to change this class to starting about 10 minutes earlier, okay? So that is what the purpose of that. So hopefully you guys will respond to that, okay? So this is uh, one thing. The other thing question was from Corin. And basically, I want everybody uh, to be aware of how the process for the homework works, okay? Uh, homework, you're encouraged to work together on it. This is not something that uh, is a test of a pre-knowledge or anything like that. As a matter of fact, it's to reinforce what you already have learned in lecture. So uh, you're encouraged to use textbooks, you're encouraged to use resources, and it's not on a timely thing. And uh, if you want to work with somebody else, which is not something that is negative, as a matter of fact, something that is positive, you're encouraged to work together with uh, your peers. And uh, the only requirement I ask for that is that you actually have to observe basically the requirements in terms of the health guidelines at least nowadays. If we were in, on campus, we would have places, places where to meet here online. If you have difficulty getting together, please let me know and I will see how we can facilitate that so that we can work together. Does this answer your question, Corin? And anybody who had doubt about how the process works for the homework assignments? Yeah, okay, good. I see your, uh, your comment in there. Okay. So, uh, Again, uh, today we're trying to finish a chapter and I have a toy in here. Actually, I actually have several of them. The one that is mounted on the, uh, on the, in front of the camera is similar to this one. And that is the so-called heat engine. Oops, the book fell. Okay. Uh, it's similar to this one, which is a, a heat engine. that basically uses heat on one side to generate a, it's like a car basically exactly similar to the car. So you have a heat source in here, you have a cylinder in here, and you have an exchange in here of gas, fluids in this case, gas. And then you have another piston on the other side. And so when the heat basically is high enough, it's going to turn, it's going to push the cylinder in here, there's an exchange of heat in here, and there is this one. So this is, in a sense, how engines work. This is called the Stirling engine, okay? What you use in your car is called an auto engine. So this is what I want to demonstrate today because we're gonna get into thermodynamics and transfer of heat. And this is a practical example. The one I have in here mounted already is identical to that one, except it has a generator, power generator also from mechanical, from heat, you convert it to mechanical energy, you convert it to electrical energy. So that's basically the concept we're going to explore today, okay? And the source of heat, I don't have gasoline. I'm not going to use gasoline. I'm going to use alcohol, actually, to burn alcohol in this uh, in this thing in here. Okay, so that's where we're going to have. That's why we have this thing in here. And uh, ideally, alcohol needs to be 90% alcohol, but the alcohol I have is only 70%. So it's going to give me a little bit of heat, not enough to uh, cause a lot of damage. Anyway, so let's get the. Uh, stuff that we didn't finish from last time, if we can find it. Okay, and it's chapter five. So this is basically, we're still doing fluids, okay? And uh, if we cannot use the atmospheric pressure to pump uh, fluids, because the maximum on Earth we can do is 10.3 meters, uh, we're going to use a pump, and this is basically what how the pumps work. So if there is a fluid in when the piston is coming, when the piston is going up in this case, it's going to open this valve, and that's going to your intake. And uh, when the piston is pressing against, it's going to close this valve and open the other one. And that's basically how mechanical pumps work. As long as you have a way of basically making a motion in here for this piston, that's how basically you pump fluids, even if 
the distance is higher than 10.3 meters. If you live in a very high rise building, how are you going to get fluids there? How are we going to get the water there? Okay, so that is basically one way of doing it. And uh, another way, or another important concept also is the concept of a barometer, which measures the pressure. And uh, because we talked a lot about pressure and uh, uh, density, and at this point, basically, uh, one way of measuring it is using this device, and basically, which is highly sensitive to the changes in pressure in the atmosphere, and basically, responds to it correspondingly. And the old days, basically, what we used to also use, and that's actually still in use too, is that you have a, 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 a liquid inside, which is usually an alcohol. And the alcohol again will respond to the changes in the pressure and will either rise if the pressure is increasing or will fall down if the pressure is coming down. So that is basically some of the principles behind it, the ideas behind measuring, because it's not physics unless you really measure it. So that's the idea. So yeah, that's why you need to, uh, to be aware of that. So atmospheric pressure is caused by the density of the Earth's atmosphere, weight of the Earth's atmosphere or temperature of the atmosphere effect. So, so it's not really the density, it's how much atmosphere you have above your shoulder. Because remember, the pressure is force divided by area. Your area is your shoulders and head and everything else, or if you happen to be not standing, it's in whatever area is basically that. So that is the area. What is the force in this case? It's the weight of the fluid above you. So that's the same thing is true for atmosphere as much as it is for also the fluids inside. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go through these questions, hopefully that you already saw a picture in my uh, in my uh, Zoom basically icon thing that has changed. So I used to have Einstein, now I changed it to Feynman actually. That guy said the picture is not me, he's Feynman. <laughs> uh, he doesn't have beards, I do, okay. Uh, he has behind him something called the YouTube. This is a YouTube, okay. I know guys, you're used to the YouTube that was somewhere in computers and things like that, but this is the contribution of physics to modern culture, basically, okay? So uh, uh, Blaise Pascal's contribution in here is the fact that, and it's actually, we saw the proof for it, theoretically, at least, is that the pressure on the fluid is the same everywhere. So if we change the fluid in here, because it needs to be the same pressure on the same level. If you increase the pressure one way, it's going to spread throughout the, uh, the, the, the fluid uniformly because the fluid is incompressible. It's not gonna compress, at least the first approximation, it's not compressible. So the pressure will basically spread throughout the entire fluid until it gets to the other side. This gives us an idea. We can use something called the uh, hydraulic press that is used actually in lifting heavy weights, okay? All you have to do, which is actually a simple machine in this case, all you have to do is apply an effort that is less as long as you move further uh, a, long, a long distance versus on the other side where you can have a load that is super he heavy and produce a lift. So the idea behind it is as follows, okay? I don't know if it's coming up or not, but here it is actually, this is the hydraulic press, okay? Because the pressure is uniformly distributed, okay? So the 500 kilogram times 10 to make it 5,000 Newton is over this big area. Needs to be the same pressure in here over this small area. Remember the pressure is force over area. If you make the area smaller, the force, if the area becomes smaller, the pressure goes higher. Or alternatively, if you make the force higher, the same thing, the pressure can go higher. So in, achieve to, in order to achieve the same balance, I, all I can do is either make the force higher or the area smaller. Here is a smaller area, gives me the same pressure produced by this uh, uh, larger mass, but over uh, a, a, small, a bigger area. In other words, I have, for example, let's say, for example, this area happened to be 10, or let's make it 100 meters squared, okay? How much area do I really need in here to produce the same pressure? I have 500 over 100, that is about five. Of course, I have to multiply it by 10 to make it a force. This is uh, just a mass. 
So I have to multiply it by 10 meter per second per second. So it's really 5,000 divided by 100. So it's 50 Pascal, okay? In order to make the same 50 Pascals in here, so I need 50 Pascals in here, I already have 10 kilogram, which I need to multiply by 10, which number I have to multiply 100 by to produce 50. So I have 100, I need to divide it by a number to get 50. What is that number that needs to be here? 100 divided by what to give me a 50? Can anybody guess? I can't see the chat, okay? So somebody has to speak up. 100 divided by what number gives me 50? Two. Okay, yes. So it's two meters squared. So all I need is a two meters squared and I'm in business. Because 10 divided by two, that's, I mean 10 divided by two, that's five. A hundred, I mean 500 divided by 100, that's also five. It's the same pressure, okay? So as long as I can do that, then that means I'm in business. Clearly this area is a lot less than this area because this load is a lot bigger than this effort. So this is the effort. With a 10 kilogram, which is about 100 Newton, which even I can lift 10 kilogram, okay? Of course I have to be well rested and all of that, but I can lift 20 pounds, can't I? I think I can, I think most of you can, okay? 20 pounds, you can lift a thousand pounds. Isn't this amazing? All you need is a hydraulic press. Lift 20 pounds, you end up with basically, just push uh, uh, the amount of uh, 20 pounds, you lift a thousand pounds on the other side. It's a lot, isn't it? You lift more than uh, your own weight, okay? And that is what the purpose of this thing in here, which is called the hydraulic press. So it's an engine really. So here is a problem. You might think, oh, then I can do a lot with this device. You can't really, because the input of the energy in this case, which is force times displacement, this distance will be the same force times this displacement here. So this will move, but little compared to this one. So you really need to move it a lot in order to produce the same effect. So the work at the end, at the end, the energy input must be equal to the energy output in your best day, okay? Because there is some losses. Usually the efficiency is how much output you get out of how much you put in it. There is no perfect engine in here, okay? There is no perfect machine in here. Does this example make sense? Okay. Again, this is the same. So 500 divided by 50 must be equal 10 divided by what? It's gonna be one, okay? So this is basically the same idea. This is the formula I've actually used. So if you're ever going to use this formula, that is basically what I have used, okay? So that is because the pressure is the same. The two pressures are identical. So this force being very little compared to a little area will produce this force, which is big force compared to a big area. The ratio is the same, okay? Whether you divide two over two, you end up with one, or you divide 2,000 over 2,000, you're going to still get one, okay? So uh, having a big area, you can allow you to load big uh, mass in there. And this is some of its applications. Okay, produce a pressure in here to lift that object in here. So again, this is the same ideas in here, okay? And it's used, hydraulic presses are used everywhere, okay? So if you see any kind of heavy machinery, they are used, okay? Actually, the braking system of a lot of heavy machinery, trucks and buses and things like that, they don't use uh, oil, they use actually uh, air in this case because they use the hydraulic press to, to to apply the same pressure. In other words, I could be a very, very old man, powerless, but I can stop a truck moving at 70 miles per hour. All I have to do is press on the brakes. That pressing on the brakes will allow me, I mean, with very little effort, okay? Press on the brakes, very little effort. You're going to bring a truck going 50, 70 miles per hour to a standstill. 
okay? Using hydraulic presses. That's why the hydraulic systems are useful, okay? The typical example is an old lady from Pasadena stopping a truck. How can she do it? Well, just putting the brakes on. Okay? <laughs> she cannot actually go outside and... Okay. Buoyancy, again, we talked about buoyancy in fluids, and it's the same thing. Buoyancy actually in gases also, it's the same idea behind it too. So, and it's really the difference in pressure, because again, pressure that depends on the height, and here there is less fluid, there is less air than in here that is pushing, so there is more air in here, the pressure is higher, and it's a difference in pressure in here that pr produces this one. And it's actually equal to the volume of the fluid displaced. So the entire atmosphere will be displaced by an amount that is equal to this volume. That is what the buoyant force is, okay? So it's the same thing as before. The amount or the weight, to be more specific, because it's a force. We need to have it in, a, in, in, in Newtons, the weight of the displaced air, okay? That is what the buoyant force is. Okay. It's the same thing. When we were doing fluids, it was the weight of the displaced fluid. Now it's just the air because it's fluid actually too, but not in the sense that we mean uh, water. Okay, fluids, when they flow, they have uh, two kinds of flow. There is a so-called uh, basically la uh, laminar flow like this one. Basically, it's like lines, okay? And there is actually chaotic flow that is actually a violent flow. Okay, So that, uh, that point is turbulent flow. Okay, so this, this is basically the typical. Now, here's the problem. The amount of flow that goes through this area per unit time, which is this amount of flow, this is the amount of fl fluid that passes in one second, must be the same amount of fluid that passes in the other side in here well, in the same second. Because what well, I'm assuming in here that there is no puncture in here, no sink in here, and there is no faucet in here dumping fluid in here. If that's the case, then the fluid that passes by in one second in here must pass by in the other second in here. Well, this suggests the following, then since this cross section is a lot bigger than this cross section, this area is a lot bigger than this area, the fluid must pass faster in here than in here. So it's a slow in the opening in here, in this, this wide area, than when it is on a narrow area. If you don't believe me, all you have to do is take a hose outside, turn on the faucet and let the flow, squeeze the end of it and you will see the fluid coming at a faster speed going on a projectile further away. You can imagine this, can't you? You do this, that's how you hose stuff, okay? <laughs> okay, that's how you do the garden too. You change just the nozzle and it's going to make it smaller or wider depending on how far you want it. Okay, very good. So that is basically the idea in here. That is the so-called conservation of fluid in here, okay? Typically, the flow, sometimes called, called the flux, okay, is the amount of fluid fluid, I'm missing an L in here, per second. Okay, that flows per second, basically, I'm just, okay? So it's usually a volume of fluid, okay? Just take the square meter area and go to the stream and see how much fluid you collect in one second. That is a flow. If, the, if it's flowing slowly, you're going to collect a little bit of flow. But if it's pouring, it's going very fast, then you're going to collect a big, basically, amount of fluid. That is what the flow, uh, how you measure the flow of fluids. Mr. Bernoulli came up with a wonderful expression in here that basically says that the pressure of a fluid, the velocity of the fluid, and also it's uh, how high, if there is an imbalance with them, govern the motion of fluids in general. This is known as Bernoulli's equation. It is the one that is responsible for, uh, for, uh, for uh, liftoff. Basically, this is how he said, the pressure in a fluid plus the 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 uh, kinetic energy in this case which is proportional to the velocity squared okay it's a density actually 
This is not the full energy. This is in a kinetic energy per unit uh, area. Okay. Not really. I mean, per unit volume, if you like. No, area, area. Okay. Okay. Do you want the full expression? Here it is. Pressure plus one half of rho times the velocity squared plus the weight of the fluid above is constant. Let me explain what this expression is. Okay. This is the pressure. This is the contribution of the kinetic energy. Not exactly the kinetic energy, but it's contribution from kinetic energy. Okay because of this V squared. So I don't care about the density at this point. And this is the weight, the contribution of the weight also, because it's not exactly the weight, okay? So because of that, that must be constant. So what that means is the following, that the energy is constant for a fluid, as long as it satisfies the condition of a laminar flow, then in this case, what happened is, if I increase the pressure, the velocity must go down, okay? if the object is of smaller height. Let me give an example of what that means in terms of a wing of a plane, okay? Here is how the typical wing of a plane look like, okay? From one side, okay? It's bulky on one side and in the other side, it's not. When the plane is taken off, in this case, the fluid coming from infinity as it takes off, the air around it has to go around this, this, this wing in order to get to the other side. On the below it, it goes straight out, okay? So this and this one, because they have to go around the, this wing in order to reach the other end. I'm, I'm looking at it from the vantage point of the, of the plane, because if you are sitting on the plane, as far as you're concerned, it's the wind or it's the, the air that is coming rushing to you. The plane is not moving because you're sipping your coffee. It's not really actually moving at all. It's the air that is moving towards it. I know from your vantage point sitting in the airport looking at the plane taken off, it's actually the plane moving, okay? But from the vantage point of the wing itself, it's the air that is coming and rushing to it. So that's basically what I'm saying here. So the air at infinity is calm. In here, when the plane passes by, it creates a disturbance and then it goes back to calm. So this air must reach this air in the same time. So for that, this air must move faster then the air below. So this one is moving slow. And because of the conservation of energy, the pressure in here is less than the pressure in here, which is high, okay? I'm sorry, the other way around. Because it's slow, the pressure in here is high. And the pressure in here must be low. It's this imbalance in pressure that creates the lift off. Lift off. This is called actually a, uh, yeah, the lift off. The, 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 uh, that's how the plane takes off, okay? If you are in a NASCAR car, a car and you're doing a racing, you take this wing and you flip it backward so that you create an imbalance in pressure so that the pressure on the top is higher than the pressure in the below so that the NASCAR stays on the track, does not fly. If you guys have not seen that, just pay attention to the cars in racing. They have wings, but they are put backward, okay? Otherwise, the, plane, the, the car starts to fly, okay? And you don't want that. So that is for uh, the, uh, the, the racing, okay? It's used actually also on how to explain the curve ball for a baseball, a lot of phenomena, okay? Again, this is the streamline. The, basically, the, uh, the, the, the pressure in here is increasing because the velocity in here is, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, it's the other way around. So the pressure, the velocity here is less. So that means the pressure is high. That's why this ones are squeezing, squeezed in here. Whereas this one in here, the velocity is high. That means the pressure is less coming from the fluid. That's why you see them if there are bubbles, they start to grow in size because there is less pressure in here. Again, this is the same idea in here. I mentioned briefly the turbulent flow. Turbulent flow speeds above a critical point becomes chaotic. So the behavior becomes nonlinear. And this is, for example, in the weather phenomena is something that is big deal because turbulence is the one that creates all kinds of uh, uh, tornadoes and all kinds of weather phenomena associated with it and those spiraling motions and things like this. So even inside the chaotic motion, there will be at least some order in there. Okay. 
Okay, okay. This is also the same idea as I was talking about. The wind outside is moving fast. The wind inside the house is not barely moving, okay? It's moving slow, okay? Because this wind is moving slow, the pressure inside will be higher than the pressure outside, and that's basically why the, 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 I was going to demo something in here. Let's see if it works, okay? If it doesn't work, don't blame me, okay? I'm going to demo this thing in here. And you can do it at home, please, okay? I know that we have our fill of the assignment. So what I did in here, I'm taking a piece of paper. And uh, we do this in classroom too, actually. If I blow on it this way, there will be actually a wind that is going to be flowing at a higher speed than and below it. So it's going to lift up. I'm not going to blow on the edges. I'm going to blow just on the surface of it. If I'm careful enough, you should see it lifting. It's not because I think it's stuck to this material in here. Try it at home. Believe me, it's going to work, okay? So one way of doing this experiment actually is coming up with two pens. If I can get another one in here them in here so that the paper and you ask which way this one is going to bend okay same thing in here i don't know if you notice or not but the bending is upward because the pressure below is actually higher than the pressure above because i created an air below it when i put those two pens okay so this is the same phenomenon in there and that is bernoulli's equation by the way okay and that is the conservation of energy in this case, that's all. Try this at home, have fun with this stuff, okay? Grab a piece of paper, put it above uh, at least a little bit so to create air below it, and then blow on the surface. Don't blow below, because if you blow below, you're gonna uh, change it, okay? And if you want to bring a straw and try it to make sure that you have a stream actually, and you will see this one at work, okay? Again, I was talking about the wing of the plane and how the plane takes off because this part of the stream is moving slower than this one because they have to meet back one another in here and that is how lift, the lift off takes, uh, the planes take off in this case, okay? Atomizers also is another example in here. So you create the same thing, a fast moving air in here and that is going to have less pressure than the one below and that causes the, the, the fluids to come up in here and you have the atomizers or perfume or, or uh, killing bugs and whatever you you wish to do, okay? Again, for trucks, and you probably saw that somehow on the freeway, you have to be careful because if the trucks are, especially if they are moving across one another, the velocity of the air between them is higher, which means less pressure, which means that the air from outside tries to squeeze them closer to one another. If there is air between them that is exists or between boats on the ocean too, this phenomenon is known there too. Okay. Okay, so we're going to skip that part in here because we have another chapter to get to. Any questions before I jump into the next slide? Next. So this is an introduction to fluid dynamics, fluid mechanics, I should say. And the next chapter is the one that I promised that we're gonna do a demo also on it. So let's get going. There is an assignment for the next chapter that I want you guys to work on, okay? And that is to understand how much energy is in your food, okay? The one that you take from your home. Okay, so we're gonna talk about thermal energy and thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is study of heat. This branch of physics was invented by an engineer, actually. Uh, it was, a lot of people worked on it, by the way, but he asked a simple question, and his question was, what was the most efficient engine? Mr. Carnot in the early 1800s, in doing so, he came up with a law. That law, people re re realized afterwards, about 20 years later, that it cannot be the first law of thermodynamics. It has to be really the second law of thermodynamics. So they placed his that law that he stated in that time, and the law basically says that if you have a, a, a cold source and a hot source, heat cannot flow spontaneously on its own from a hot uh, from a cold source to a hot source. It always flows from hot source to a cold source. Okay, that is the, the so-called second law of thermodynamics. 
people realize that, wait a minute, there is a, there is a law that is far more fundamental than this one. So we need to put this one second that was discovered first and put the second that we actually are going to formulate and we knew about it as first. And the first law became the law of conservation of energy. During the process, energy is conserved and that is the first law of thermodynamics. A little short after that, after these two laws became famous and known, people realized that, oops, we made a mistake. We need another law before the first law, okay? <laughs> so, so what do you do in this situation? You already have made the second law well known and you made the first law well known, but you need a law before the first law. So what should you do? Move everything aside and you will have the third law being first. I mean, the first law discovered being third. The second law discovered stays second. And the third law basically stated, stated becomes first. Well, if you probably guessed that they didn't do that because they were already entrenched those two laws. So they called the third law that was discovered basically that was stated last as being the zeroth law. So that's why this law, this branch of science has three laws. The zeroth law of thermodynamics and the first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics. But they were actually put in, in, the, in the reverse order when they were discovered. The se second law was discovered first, the first law was discovered second, and the zeroth law was discovered last. Okay, so it was this is the history of this branch of science. It is really one of the most important branches of science that you probably are going to encounter in your studies, no matter where you are. If you're going to be majoring in any kind of science whatsoever, you're going to find the branch of thermodynamics in it, engineering, everything that has to do with, with, with anything involves uh, thermodynamics, biology involves thermodynamics. How in the world is a process that, that, that is chemical, for example, in nature, uh, takes a system from one state to another state if we don't understand thermodynamics. Economy uh, uh, relies on it. As a matter of fact, philosophers nowadays are entangled in these subjects, especially the second law of thermodynamics. Religious people are also debating the second law of thermodynamics. It's really the probably the far most reaching branch of science that you can find in there, and that is the, therm the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, enough said about this introduction. The first thing we're going to do is the concept of temperature. And this relies on the so-called zeroth law of thermodynamics that basically says the following. If an object is in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium with another object, what I mean by thermal equilibrium, I can clearly see that this is not moving in any way whatsoever in shape possible. Therefore, I'm assuming that it's equilibrium, OK? OK, so it's not moving. So these two things are in thermal contact. For example, take your cup of water or cup of coffee, sorry, boiling hot and put it on the kitchen top, okay? So in this case, and wait, obviously the hot coffee is a lot hotter than the room around you. Wait, wait for five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, half an hour. I mean, that's the same thing, sorry. Uh, half a day if you need to. At the end, the coffee will be the same temperature with the room. I would say at that point that the coffee is in thermal equilibrium with the room where I am at, okay? The same token, take a, a, a cup of uh, water full with ice. It's supposed to be at uh, zero degrees Celsius or very close from it and put it in room temperature and wait. Same amount of time if need be or more, okay? Ultimately, that water will become the same temperature as the room temperature. I would say in this case that the cup of water that is, was ice cold now has reached thermal equilibrium because it's in contact with the air, okay? So I have object one and I have object two and they are in thermal contact and both of them have reached their thermal equilibrium, okay? If I bring another object three, object three, and make it in contact with object two and wait for it also to reach thermal equilibrium. So what I'm saying in here is that they have reached thermal equilibrium. Both this one and two and two and three. Well, the zeroth law, I mean, the zeroth has said the following. It says that this two must also be in thermal equilibrium. That's the conclusion of it, must be in thermal equilibrium.
So if object one and object two are in thermal equilibrium, F, this is an F. And if object two and object three are also in thermal equilibrium, and there is a big F there, then object one and three are also in thermal equilibrium. This allows me to do something which is very critical. And then the thermometer, this allows for the invention of a thermometer. Thermometer. So basically what you do, you take water, which is system one or object one, and you take a, a, a thermometer made out of alcohol or whatever your preferred material is, okay? And you bring them in contact, thermal contact. Make sure the eye, the 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 the, the, the uh, water is freezing, it's frozen. Call that temperature zero degree Celsius. Okay. Now there is a thermometer. You scale that in here. Add a little bit of heat to it. You will see, or at least wait until it starts boiling. Add heat until it boils. When it reaches the boiling point. Call that 100 degrees Celsius, just basically temperature. So we have water, we have water in here, and we have a device in here which is a thermometer made out of a gas of mercury or whatever thermometer, whatever you like to make your therm your, your 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 thermometers with. Okay. Somebody else says, you know what? I don't like that at all. I don't like this as being zero degrees. I want to call this one 30 degree uh, degree Fahrenheit. That's fine. No problem. And I want to call this number 212 degree Fahrenheit. That's fine, no problem. This guy says, this is 100. That means that every single step in here is 100, I mean, they amount to 100. So I take this line in here and divide it equally to about 100 spaces. This one though, 212 minus uh, 32 is actually 180. So the spacing in here is closely to one another because I need 180 of them. Okay, so this is how the Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit basically was invented and this is the centigrade or uh, centigrade or uh, Celsius system, okay? Both of them are thermometer, they're measuring the same thing. Now, I have a thermometer that was in thermal equilibrium with my water I can take it and measure something else. Today's temperature, the air, for example, in this room. The temperature, for example, in this room today, for example, I have no idea, okay? I didn't look at the, my, my phone. Let's say, for example, it's 71 degree Fahrenheit. Well, I trust by the first law that this is accurate because my first object was this one. My second object was the gas or the fluid or whatever that made up that thermometer. And now I'm actually measuring with it something else. And with confidence, I'm saying that that's actually the temperature. If somebody else uses a different, different scale and say, actually, the temperature today is, let's like, say, uh, 21 degrees Celsius, actually, these two temperatures, I don't know. I didn't do the conversions, please. Okay, <laughs> But the point being in here is that's another scale, and it's the same temperature. Both of them are measuring the same temperature, one of them on a different scale than the other. Does this make sense to you guys? We have okay. question regarding to diverting or changing Celsius to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to Celsius. Yeah, the, how to convert from one system to the other. Yes, there is a formula for it. I'm going to give you the formula for it, okay? And is we have question in exam and quizzes to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to Celsius. Uh, I don't think so, okay? But if you want to, I'm going to give you the formula for it, OK? I myself, I grew up in a country where uh, we used to use the Celsius and not the Fahrenheit. So I still do that automatically. I mean, honestly. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you tell me a temperature, I mean, I was the first time in this country, the weatherman was saying to him, the temperature is 76 degrees, and it's a wonderful day. Are you crazy? 76 degrees? That's that's going to kill me. <laughs> so I have to pull the calculator and do the numbers. And now, oh, yeah, you're right. OK. So it, it, it doesn't talk to you when you're not used to these units. OK. But if you want to, we can cover this one. I don't think that there is a question for that. But I'm just giving you that. Uh, I will give you the formula if you like. OK. It's really something that should not be hard to do. I mean, if using these scales, you can find it. OK. 
So that is basically the first part in here, and that is now how we how we measure measure temperature. Because here is the problem: I can tell you this cup is hot, and this cup is hotter. Okay, I can feel them. I can actually put my hand on them. Okay, but how about if you bring a third cup in their place and you say, "Oh, this is actually hotter than the first one, but less hot than the second one." Again, now you have a way of intuitively have that feel. Now, if you bring a fourth cup or a seven, 27th cup, okay, and now you have a problem, you lose track of things. But if you have numbers appended to them, then you know. If the first one, let's say, for example, was 21 degrees Celsius, and the second one was 27.5 degrees Celsius, not only you know how that it's hotter, but how big the difference in heat is. Okay, versus 21 and 22, then you have it. So that's why measurements in here in the first law or zeroth law is important, okay? Absolute zero is something that is essential when we're doing uh, uh, physics. This is the temperature. If I look at the diagram PV equal to NRT for gases, all of them seem to be converging to a point where there seem to be the, all the gases basically freeze from motion because we will know that this temperature has to do with the motion of the elements of the fluid in there or the object in there. Okay. At some point, we will reach a point where they don't move. The volume comes to zero. This is, I mean, the, the pressure drops to zero, okay? For, this is, P is a function of temperature. Pressure is a function of temperature, not as a function of volume. But the point being in here is that is basically with the concept of uh, temperature. Here is a big deal, okay? Heat and temperature are not the same. They are not the same. Heat is an energy that is transferred between two objects. One of them is hot and one of them is cold. That is heat. So you transfer energy in this case because of the imbalance in the, in the, in the temperature. However, the temperature is an intrinsic. I can take the thermometer and plug it into any device and I will know its temperature. So the temperature is a property of the object that tells me how fast it's, it's, uh, it's in, in, in inner parts are moving, whereas heat is not. Heat is just an exchange of energy between two points in here. They are not the same thing. As a matter of fact, the units for them are not the same. Heat is an energy measured in the units of energy, which is typically joule or calories. And that's what you see in your food when you go into your food, okay? And temperature is measured in temperature units, like for example, degree Celsius or degree Fahrenheit or even Kelvin, or even there is another unit for it that, what is that other one? Forgot the name for it, okay? There are so many units for temperature, but they are not in Joule, okay? This is heat. Then we're gonna talk about heat, quantity of heat, and this is exactly what you're supposed to be doing today. You're going to go into your refrigerator, okay? And you're going to pull an item or two or three, I think, and, and look at how many calories it tells you. Calories it tells you. Okay, and the ingredients in there. That is actually another unit for energy too. Calorie is a unit for energy. However, you have to be very careful with the wording on the, 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 the ingredients of that item. Okay. Either it's spelled with lowercase c calorie or with the uppercase C calorie. It makes a difference between the two writings. This one is a small energy. This one is a thousand times bigger. If you write it with lowercase C, it's different in value than if you write it with a capital C. So some of the vendors basically of food, what they do instead of writing it in here, so to confuse you a little, they write everything in caps. Okay? So the subject in here is for the discussion today, you go in your refrigerator, pick up an item that you, uh, you look in there, okay? And uh, see how many calories are in it, okay? That's the first thing. The second, is it spelled correctly? You need at least the first letter to be capital. If it is capital, you're in business. If somehow the first letter is not in capital, there is something wrong in here. I need to know about it. We need to know about it. We need to be alarmed to some extent. 
Is it a typo or is it really true? Because if it's really lowercase c, that means that this food has practically no energy whatsoever. That means it's not gonna cause you any problems whatsoever, okay? But if it's a big C, then that's spelled correct. It doesn't matter if the rest is lowercase or the rest, all of it in caps, okay? So that is the key in here when we get into the idea of uh, how to measure temperature, I mean, uh, heat. So heat is measured in calories, at least in the commercial applications. And uh, that is your task. Now, the last part, so there are two assignments in it. You're supposed to see how many calories in the food. Peter, like <laughs> you want the mic? Okay, <laughs> turned off the... Okay. Sir, I have... couldn't understand the second question. That's why I turned on my <laughs> mic. Okay. okay. So, uh, uh, man, we didn't even get into the... Uh, but we're going in detail about these things. Okay. So the first part of the question, how many calories? That's it. The second part is the spelling. Is it spelled correct to the proper C or a capital C or not? If it has no capital C in the beginning, you have a problem. I need to know about it, okay? It's either the rest of it is lowercase or the rest of it, all of it is in caps, okay? The rest doesn't matter. It's the first letter that matters, okay? The third part, do you think they have a lot of energy in that food or not? Are you surprised that that's, that's too high or not? And would that make you change your mind this time not to buy this food or not? Okay. So is it too high? And if it's too high, are you going to not buy it in the future or you're happy with it? Okay. This is my favorite food. I don't care what you say. Okay. <laughs> that makes me happy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is this clear now, Sapita? Everybody else? Yes, sir. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So, you again. One? Sorry, I was helping my mom with something. Okay. So, how many calories? That's step one. The number. It could tell you 120 calories, 180 calories, uh, 307 calories. That's a number. The second one is, is it properly spelled? Needs to first letter to be in caps. Okay. And the last one in here is, were you surprised that the number is too high or is it good? You like it, you don't care, okay? <laughs> don't judge me, I like this food in here, so, okay? So that's basically uh, things like this, okay? That's fine, we have no, we, we don't make any judgments in here whatsoever, okay? I like food too, that's my favorite part of the year. My favorite part of it. Anyway, then we're going to examine the laws of thermodynamics. As I mentioned, there are two other laws that we will need. The second law is that uh, that of the conservation of energy. And the third law, I already mentioned it, or the second law, I'm sorry, I mentioned it already. And that is the fact that heat cannot spontaneously move from one location to the other without really having a, uh, can, cannot move from a, a, a low temperature to a high temperature spontaneously on its own. I know you tell me, how about the refrigerator? I see the refrigerator is doing that. Let me tell you how the refrigerator works. You take food that is cold, okay? And you put it in the refrigerator. You take, for example, something that, milk, for example, that is already uh, cold and you pour it in your, in your coffee and then you put it back in the refrigerator. It's already cold. But the refrigerator, what it does from it, it extracts heat from it and dumps that heat on the back of the refrigerator. If you don't believe me, just step behind the refrigerator and you see it's hot, okay? So it's getting that heat from where? From the stuff that is inside of it. So the refrigerator works backward. It takes heat from the cold and dumps it in the hot, which is outside. But that's not a spontaneous. You need to do, the refrigerator is doing work actually to do that. And how do I know it's doing work? Because you're going to receive a bill at the end of the month from the uh, power company, okay? Because you do that. But an engine is the other way around. The engine takes heat from a hot source and does work with it and then dumps a little of heat also still. And then if you don't believe me, just go to the exhaust pipe and 
the, the heat and the engine itself, and you see it hot because it's trying to cool down, okay? I have an engine in here. Let me see if I can get it going. It has alcohol in it. First of all, let me change cameras. Okay, so let me remove the background still. Okay, here is the engine that I have in here. Let me change the camera a little bit angle. Okay, it has a, uh, a cylinder in here that is in contact with the uh, source of heat in here, which is going to be actually which made up of uh, alcohol inside of it. Okay, so I'm going to turn this thing in here. I'm going to uh, light it up. Okay. So this part of the cylinder is going to be in contact with the, with the heat source, which is this one, which is made out of alcohol. And then it's going to push the cylinder back and forth. As the cylinder is pushed back, it's going to compress on the air in this exchange in here. And this air in here will push this cylinder and this cylinder will make this, this wheel turn. This wheel is attached directly to an engine, I mean a motor, electrical motor that is, in the bottom in here. Let me remove this so it doesn't spill. It's attached, oh man, I cannot change it. Let me get the other one. I cannot move it because I attached to the, uh, to the place in there. So this is the principle of the idea behind it, okay? As this one turns, it's going to turn this electrical motor, which is sitting in here, and this electrical motor will generate energy, and that energy will light a light bulb. I mean, but I don't have a light bulb in here. I have a, uh, actually, if I can find it, I have a uh, diode which will act as a light bulb, but it's not going to light because this this thing is loose. Actually, this this string in here is loose, and it's as if you have a problem with your with your alternator in the car when it's loose. It squeezes and makes noise because it's not pressed correctly on the uh, on the uh, alternator in the car. Okay, so this is similar to what you see in there. So let me get the thing to be lit. And we're going to use this principle now and work on an engine, okay? So, oh man, I don't have enough, I don't have enough, uh, if I don't, I need to have bring more alcohol in here, okay? Okay, hold on guys a second, okay? I'm gonna go and get some, uh, some alcohol in here, okay? So it should be using the principle in here of this heat thing. I just put plenty in there just to make sure. But I hope that this support doesn't light up now. So if this classroom goes in fire, you know who caused it. <laughs> OK. Let me move this out of the way a little bit and let's turn the heat on now. Hey, Professor, is it possible to switch uh, screens and put it on the big screen? Is it? Hold on. You're right. Yeah, it's really small. On okay. Yeah, so it's let's... kind of hard to see. You guys see it now? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So. This is the hot source now, okay? As long as the flames are on, this should start going. It's like your engine, you need to really start it. So you need to kick it to get it going. So it's not gonna start on its own, honestly, okay? Have you seen those movies with the old cars where they have those uh, <laughs> those things to crank, to crank them, to get, going, to get them going? This is similar, okay? Promise it's going to work, okay? Even if. It's trying.
what we have in here. Okay, we have the heat source that is compressing this cylinder. Okay, and uh, there is a heat exchange in here at constant volume, and it's pushing on this gas in here, and now it's going crazy. Okay, <laughs> so now it's going crazy. So uh, it's pressing on this gas in here, and it's trying to turn this this uh, this electrical motor. The electrical motor is supposed to be attached to a uh, to a uh, light source, and the light source I used earlier did not work well because of the fact that the the uh, string there was kind of loose on it. So let me try to bring another one in here. I have a diode in here, okay? And this diode, if you're not too familiar with it, is really conducts electricity in one side and not the other. This leg is a li little longer, so this is the positive side. And the other one is the negative side. So if I connect it in here, theoretically, this light bulb should go on. But it will not because I don't have enough torque on this engine, actually, honestly, because of that loose thing in there. So it's not coming on. Besides, you really have to turn off, turn on, uh, turn off the lights to, to really see if it works in, in there. Okay. So this is basically. There is another principle that we're going to get into it, and I hope that at some point we're I'm going to replace the uh, that rubber thing in there to have this one work. Okay. This will go forever as long as there is alcohol in there. So we have to turn off the engine, I guess. So when you turn it off, it's going to come back to a stop again, just to show to, to understand that this engine actually was being driven by the heat source, okay? This engine is an example of a, uh, of a heat engine. What is the other camera? It's an example of a heat engine. This is called the Stirling engine though. So, okay, it was, um, it's a, it's a pattern, pattern for it. And this is similar to this engine too, but this one requires more actually, it requires just a, uh, a cup of water that is underneath either too cold or too hot, one of the compared to the room and it's going to also start going too, going up and down. And I have actually two, four of them all together in here, okay? Anyway, this is thermodynamics. It's, oh man, this camera is hot now because of the heat source next to it, okay? Uh, so this is basically thermodynamics, and that is the one that allows us to work on engines. Your car engine, though, uses a different uh, process called the auto engine, and the auto engine is not spelled A-U-T-O. It's actually spelled O-T-T-O, and that's the ger German, basically, guy who basically invented the process. And the same thing for the uh, for the for the uh, trucks and cars. I mean, big uh, big engines. They use actually the uh, this uh, the uh, diesel engine, which is actually invented also by the uh, guy by the name of diesel. Anyway, so this is basically the uh, principle for the laws of thermodynamics. It is the entropy in here. I know I'm not going to go through a lot of this details. I'm expecting you guys to go through this chapter. So I'm going to basically probably selectively pick up stuff because this introduction is actually all of the things in it. Okay, so I'm hoping that you guys go through these things, complete the assignment, and make sure you review all of the materials. If you have any questions, please let me know. I already stated the, the zeroth law. The first law is the conservation of energy. During the process through which this one was, there is work done by the engine. And how is it done by the engine? By, by, by expanding, by pushing against the air. That is work, or against anything. That is work. And there is heat added to it. The sum of this heat and the, and the, and the work are actually, actually what changes the energy of the system. So this is the first law. The second law though, is the one that I already stated and that is heat cannot spontaneously move from a cold source to a hot source. You need something to help it in the long, along the way. Like a refrigerator, for example, it needs to do work to take heat from a cold ice cream to make it even colder and dump that excess heat outside and the, and the other one. And if you don't believe me, wait toward the end of the month and you will see that you're paying for it too, okay? The heat engine though uses a hot source, which you have to pay for. I mean, this alcohol is not free. The, 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 uh, the, the gasoline that you put in your car is not free. You have to pay for it. You have to go to the pump and pay for it. 
takes that energy inside the gasoline, which is a chemical energy, and convert it into a mechanical energy where the wheels start to move and the car starts to go. The trouble with the, this law, though, the second law is there is always a dump of heat outside. The efficiency is never 100%. It's always less than 100%, OK? Car not engine turned out to be the most efficient engine there is. The concept of entropy is intrinsically related to the second law of thermodynamics. And that is the so-called order and disorder, OK? And this is where philosophers and religious people are having all kinds of debate on this issue, whether God exists or not, based on this one. If you are on the side of God, the existence of God, you think that the entropy started with a finite value. I mean, uh, and it's ever since at that point, it's, it's increasing, basically, until at some point, disorder will uh, will eventually uh, end up, okay? And then the people who are on the side of uh, non-existence of God, they will assume, they will tell you, no, actually at some point the entropy will rearrange itself and basically the process is cyclic. And there is a big debate there and what happened before the Big Bang and what happened after the Big Bang to this idea. What happened actually on the event horizon inside the black hole as far as the entropy? Because it's overarching. A chemical reaction can never happen if the entropy doesn't allow it. So you need either a catalyst or you need a, a, an, an energy for it to happen if the entropy doesn't allow it. And it's still at that point, the entropy will allow it with waste, okay? A, a biological system cannot grow technically if the entropy does not allow it. It's really a very deep concept in here. Mr. Uh, Isaac Asimov actually, who was a chemist and wrote a lot of books, if you guys are not familiar with them. Uh, anyone read his books, The Foundation and all of that? Let me write his name here. It's fun. Okay. Has a famous story about how the universe basically, uh, uh, about the last question. It's a good story to read. It might, it might, uh, it might hurt your faith, okay, if you are of the religious type, so you have to be careful with this. Uh, it's called the last question, okay, <laughs> because he's on the other side of the earth. So again, the entropy is a big deal, okay, and it's not because of philosophy. We don't care about that in physics. We care about it because of applications like this, or applications in biology, or applications in in, in, in chemistry or applications in everything, everyday physics, or even the economy itself, everyday life, basically. That's why we can, metaphysics and other things, we don't know. At least for the black hole, the event horizon, we know that the entropy there, there is no problem, it's conserved because matter disappears, but the information stays in. And that is actually a conservation of, uh, of, and that problem was resolved by Stephen Hawking in one of his publications, basically. So that we know actually there is no problem there because it was really something scary. Is the second law of thermodynamics violated inside a black hole? It turns out, no, it's still uh, valid there too, okay? So this is a very powerful law. As a matter of fact, some people speculate now, or at least they have theories about how time is related to entropy. And the only reason why we cannot travel back in time is because of this entropy thing that is putting constraint. And the only reason why we move spontaneously in the future, I mean, right now, we're going to go to a few minutes later from now, or it's 10.03, and about three minutes will be in 10.06, because the entropy is the one that is pushing us forward in time. Basically, the time and the entropy are related. So there's a lot of things in there, okay? But again, it's the second law of thermodynamics. Since it's the second law of thermodynamics, it's very important, it's probably worth writing it, okay? And this is the second question of the debate today, or the second question of the uh, second item. So the second law of thermodynamics, and I want you to look at it in your, uh, in, your uh, uh, in, in the book too, state the following, no uh, spontaneous uh, heat, can flow from a cold source to a hot one. As simple as that. The key word in here is spontaneous. The refrigerator is an example where the heat flows from a cold source to a hot source, but that's not spontaneous, okay? If you take, for example, your ice cream 
and put it on the table and wait for the ice cream to get colder, that's not going to happen. See that? <laughs> it's like you take your coffee and it's cold coffee, okay? You had it there sitting for three hours. And now you say, you know what? I want my coffee to get hot. So you put it on the refrigerator. You put it on an, ice, uh, an iceberg and expect somehow the ice to get colder and the coffee to get hotter. That's not going to happen. It's the other way around. Is this law intuitive enough for you guys to understand? This is the same law that basically if you, if you, if you, if you, and you see that on YouTube, for example, where people come in and jump from a high building to the swimming pool. If you play the movie backward, where the person jumps from the swimming pool back to the roof, I mean, it looks like he's moving backward and flipping and all of a sudden he's in the, uh, the roof of the building, then you know that's wrong. You don't have to wait for anybody to tell you. It cannot happen, why? because a person falls down, it splashes the water, everything goes everywhere. Take uh, your plate made out of glass and drop it on the floor, on a hard floor. What happened to it? Plate or a cup, this cup, for example, if I take it and drop it on a hard surface, what happened to it? It breaks breaks into two pieces or 27, 3,000, so many pieces, yes. Too many pieces. Too many pieces. Imagine I tape this one, imagine I video uh, record it and then play the movie backward for you. You see all the pieces coming together and coming back into my hand. You know it's fake, okay? You don't want to wait for Mr. Trump to tell you it's fake news, it is already fake news. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that is exactly what the second law is saying, that this process cannot happen by itself. You need somebody to come and pick up the pieces together and probably glue them and heat them up and maybe rework this glass again and give you the glass again and fill it up with water and tell you here is the water. Maybe it will happen, but not spontaneously. Okay. Spontaneously, the other way around is fine. You see it, you know it's, it's true, okay? So that is basically what the second law of thermodynamics is telling you. The, both of those two things are the same, identical. The example with the glass breaking into so many pieces and not being able to assemble itself and come back to your hand is the same thing, identical to this second law of thermodynamics. The second example is closer to the concept of entropy as we know it today. I mean, the, both of them are the same thing, which is the entropy, okay? The last things of this one is the so-called heat capacity, specific heat capacity. If I take a, a piece of water, for example, this water cold, and if I, or coffee, let's take an example of coffee, and bring in it an ice cube. In this case, heat will flow from the cup of coffee to the ice cube in the process melting the ice cube down. Where would they be at equilibrium? That depends on the specific heat of water versus that of the ice cube. Same thing, if I have this one cold and they take a, 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 a piece of iron that is so hot, actually it's red in color and put it in here again, they will reach thermal equilibrium. The heat will flow from the red hat nail to the, uh, to the water, heating the water in the process, okay? But it doesn't go backward. It doesn't go the other way around. Heat cannot flow from the water to the hot nail in this case. Okay. So in this case, again, it's the second law that is telling us what's going on. And where would they reach? Their equilibrium depends on their so-called thermal capacity. It turns out uh, the water has a very high thermal capacity. Water has a high, very high thermal capac capacity versus the, 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 the earth, versus the ground. Why? Uh, how do we know that? For example, how does it impl implicate the weather? Let me tell you how that is. During daytime, the, 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 the seashore is getting hot, okay, from the sun, baking in the sun. Same thing, the water is actually baking under the same sun. But because the water can absorb a lot of heat before its temperature increases slightly, its temperature is less than that of the 
the the uh, the shoreline. So the shoreline, its temperature increases higher because it has low heat capacity. It doesn't take much heat for it to raise its temperature. Whereas water, you need a lot of heat to raise its temperature. So water is cooler, nicer than the land. Land is actually warmer in that time. And because of the air mass moves move from hot to cold, as a matter of fact, you will see a breeze, in this case, flowing the fluid, and you will feel it from the ocean, OK? Moving actually from cold to hot. So you will feel the breeze from the ocean, okay, cooling down the earth, okay? That is the air mass moving this way. Again, that's an exchange of heat. During the nighttime, it's the other way around. During nighttime, the temperature drops because there is no sun and because the heat capacity of the, of the, of the land is a lot less than that of the water, its temperature drops much, much higher than that of the ocean. So the ocean temperature is regulator. It regulates the, 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 its environment. So if you live near the ocean, it's good because the temperature, if it increases too much on land, the water, the ocean will cool it down in, in this process. It's the other way around too. When it gets too cold, again, heat will flow from outside from the ocean to the land to cool it down. And that is because of the specific heat of water being so high compared to iron, for example. Okay, or compared to uh, dirt, which is mainly mainly calcium and other uh, materials that are in, the, in it. Okay, so that is really the idea of specific heat in here. Okay, then we have the thermal expansion. Thermal expansion, if I take a metal or any material for that matter and heat it up, it's going to expand, which bring, uh, makes a problem for engineers, for example, when they build homes with, with the steel beams in them. So you really need to allow for that expansion. Otherwise, you're going to see buckling. And the same thing also is true for train tracks. So the train track, uh, it's made up of portions of it, okay, on the same track, okay, on the same side of the track. So that when it heats up, when the material expands, there is room for it to expand. If you make them too close, it's going to buckle and cause an uh, accident. Or actually, the train, the, the lines will twist, OK? And the same thing is true, actually, for cement. So that's what you notice on the freeway. That's a made of different, basically, portions of it. So when it gets hot and it expands, there is room for it. Expansion in the winter is going to contract. Same thing for the power lines, as a matter of fact. The power lines, in the summer, they, 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 they fall little. In the winter, they rise a little. So if you're an engineer trying to build uh, telecommunications or uh, power lines for electricity or something like that, you have to take that phenomenon into effect, OK? How much increase in length depends on how much change in temperature and depends on the material also. Steel has a different properties than, for example, copper or different materials in there. So you have to take that into account. Some materials are much easier to expand than others, OK? So this is the thermal expansion. And the expansion of water is also no different than the other ones, except water has a peculiar behavior when it comes to temperature. Okay? This is unique to water, actually. Water, when, when you decrease its temperature, its volume starts to decrease, decrease, decrease up to around zero degrees Celsius, not exactly about four degrees Celsius. Uh, it's going to change. Its density actually changes a little. And then, when you decrease it below zero degrees Celsius, the density increases, actually. I mean, I'm sorry, the density decreases, not increases. The density, its volume expands, actually, while decreasing the temperature. So this property is unique to water. That's why in the, in the pond and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, even the swimming pools, when they start to freeze, they start to freeze from the top down. They don't freeze from bottom up. Because if they get too hot, I mean too cold, they can and they can freeze below those temperatures, then they start to freeze from the bottom. And that is not a suitable environment for uh, for fish, for example, which is a problem. Because if the water does not have these properties, in other words, the density of ice is less than the density of normal water. And that's why when you see uh, uh, icebergs, it's only about 10% of them above the surface, and about 90% of them is actually sunk. Why? Because the density of ice is less than that of the uh, of, of water by that ratio. 
okay? But that ratio. If the density of ice, like any other material, when it becomes cooler, its density increases, is higher, then the iceberg will fall all of it inside. And that accident would not have happened for those two actors in the movie Titanic, if you have saw it, if you have seen it, okay? So that is a point in here, that the ice will fall. But the problem with the, the ice falling inward is that it's going to go in and more ice will fall in and more ice will fall in until the entire ocean comes into a, a frozen state. So it's because of this property that life was able to, uh, to, 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 to survive this planet of water. If water wa did not have this property, like any other material that does have it, then life would not have been possible in here because life must have evolved also in the ocean is existent with tremendous uh, ocean. It's, and the ocean is, a uh, is an essential cycle of the life cycle in here on earth. So if, if that did not exist, life would not have evolved and prospered anywhere on the planet. So this is a critical property of, 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 uh, of, uh, of water. And it's unique to water. As a matter of fact, if you look at other uh, moons, for example, of Jupiter, Europa specifically, and even Callisto and other moons of uh, in the in the outer solar system, uh, they're made up of. We know that they have water inside, and that water is not just any water. It's a salty water, just like our water in here on Earth, our oceans mainly. But they have a thick layer of ice because they're super far away from the sun and they are so cold frozen. That's why we think there must be life that exists right now in a moon like Europa, which revolves around the uh, Jupiter. So why? Because it has the right conditions for it. So if water were did not have this property and if the it has frozen on the surface, it must be frozen underneath but we know there must be liquid water. Actually, we know that because of the geysers that it's, they're coming out of the moon and we were able to analyze their chemistry and find that they actually have salty water in there. It's not just any kind of water, it's salty water. So that is basically the idea for this entire chapter, the properties of the different materials and everything else in it. I know I didn't go through the slides, so I'm trusting that you guys have access to the slides. You go through them. You answer the questions, make sure you understand them. Have any question, please let me know. Do not struggle through it by yourself, okay? And uh, let me go quickly in here to see if the conversion from Celsius to centigrade, the question that Sapida asked. I don't think it's required, Sapida, but if you really want to, I'm gonna send that to you guys, okay? On how to convert from, this is the Kelvin and the uh, centigrade. Okay, we talked about thermal energy. We talked about all of these things, okay? This is the, the assignment that your guys have in here. So here is what I was talking about. One calorie with a big C is a thousand calories with little C, okay? So if you have, if you take anything in there, depending on the amount, you're taking that much energy in it. I'm glad we don't have thanks. I mean, we don't have uh, Thanksgiving and we don't Halloween. We don't have Halloween in this semester, and we don't even have Christmas in this semester, or any one of those holidays where there is a big intake of calories and we suffer the consequences afterwards. So that is really my concern in there. So the 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 the, 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 the spring semester is good semester. That's why I like spring. Okay. <laughs> but uh, this is what worries me during those times because of this big C versus little C. That means multiply that number by 1,000. So if they tell you I have 180 calories in this much food, you really have 180,000 calories of energy. And each one of those calories can be this many joules. So basically, you read, if you do the math, you really have to exercise for a long, 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 long time to just get rid of this candy. OK? It's not good. That's why I don't like candy, OK? So these questions basically that are related to those things, all of this. I'm just trying to go through this one in here quickly. You hear you hear up a half cup of tea and temperature rises by eight degrees Celsius. How much will the temperature rise if you add up the same amount of heat to a full cup of the cells of uh, of uh, of? Uh... Okay. You double the heat. No. What do you do? So you have a uh, you, no, you keep the heat the same, but you double the amount of matter. So now it's going to split on 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 
twice as much. So that's why the correct answer is four, okay? Please do not hesitate to ask any of these questions because I'm assuming that this chapter also is will fully cover this. This is a concept of um, uh, entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. Whenever energy freely transfers from one form to another direction of transformation is toward the state of greater disorder. So the only reason why my bed is never made is because the law of entropy. So don't blame anybody, don't blame me. So if somebody comes to your room, your mom, for example, or your spouse or somebody else, hey, your bed is not made. Well, don't blame me. That's the second law of thermodynamics, okay? That's disorder, okay? <laughs> so the greater the disorder, the higher the entropy. That is basically what this law is, okay? So the natural center system tend to disperse from concentrated and organized energy states toward diffuse and disordered organized states. So this is the second law in terms of the entropy. The way I stated it early in, term, in terms of the temperature, that is actually equivalent to the statement. They are exactly the same thing, okay? That heat does not flow spontaneously from a cold source to a hot source. And this is basically the calories. That, oh no, this is a specific heat. So the specific heat now you have to be careful, for example, why? Because the water that is in the food itself has, uh, the food that it has water in it that has a very high specific heat. So usually it takes a long time for it to cool because of that water, okay? Retains a lot of heat, okay? And this is what I was talking about, the specific heat and its impact on the weather phenomenon on earth. And this is exactly my point earlier about the same amount of heat going to the shoreline and the land. And in this case, the ocean temperature hardly budges from 20 degrees Celsius during the day and hardly budges from 20 degrees Celsius during the night either. So it stays moderated and it's going to help the environment. This temperature changes drastically between day and night for the land, okay? And this is the buckling of the steel that I was talking about. And this is the freeways where they use this one also for that phenomenon because of the heat. So these engineers in here, they didn't do a good job in uh, predicting the change in temperature, okay? Again, this is the thermal expansion. If you hit it up, in this case, it's going to expand, allowing this material to go through it, okay? And one of the applications is actually in uh, sensory systems in, the, in this case, because different materials have different, uh, different, uh, different uh, coefficient of a linear expansion. So one of them will bend more than the other, depending on which way the temperature is. And this is actually can be used to gauge the temperature. So this can be used, the strips in here can be used to tell me how much temperature is, whichever way they bend, depending on the two metals. One of them will expand higher than the other with the temperature. So I can use that to gauge the temperature, okay? So if it goes up, I can tell by which way this, this bending happened. If it goes down, I can tell which way it happened because of the materials in here, okay? And this is the expansion properties of water. So when it cools down, ice is less dense because it's more organized and there is more spacing. Whereas when it's in the liquid form, Actually, there is a van der Waals force that forces it to basically more or less interact, but it's denser. So this is unique. That's why ice floats on, on, on water, okay? And this is basically what I was talking about in terms of the density for the water, okay. So I think we covered all of this stuff and this is what I was making a big fuss over it for the, uh, for the ocean in general. The fish can survive in the bottom because the liquids, the water is still uh, liquid. Whereas the top surface of the uh, of the pond is frozen, okay. So the 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 pond will freeze from top to bottom, not from bottom up. If it freezes from bottom up, all the oceans will be frozen by now. Okay, okay. Please cover all of the materials. I know we went through it all of them in detail, and I even did a demo for you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and I will see you guys next week and again i'm going to send you a survey to see if change of time uh, okay see you guys yes uh, um i wasn't quite clear on the item two of the discussion you mentioned in detail the second law of thermodynamics how did you want us to apply that to the second item mm -hmm. of the discussion 
just basically state it in your own words. Understand it and state it in your own words, okay? Okay, so in your own words, great. Yeah, because you need to be familiar with it. That's all. Thank you.